Indie games. I think it's safe to say that everyone loves them, regardless of what genre they could be. Platformer, RPG, Metroidvania, horror, it really doesn't matter, honestly. They're a super important part of the gaming industry as a whole and are many people's passion projects they pour a ton of time and effort into, so it goes without saying that they could either succeed heavily and carry a generation or fall flat on their faces. As a matter of fact, some of my favorite games of all time are indie games. The Binding of Isaac Repentance, Cuphead, A Hat in Time, though there's one game that's always stuck out to me. And that game is Super Meat Boy. Dude, this shit rocks! With its tight controls, clever level design, and wide array of playstyles with different unlockable characters and levels, Super Meat Boy took over the indie game scene in the early 2010s, when indie games were just starting to pick up steam. Hell, it's got Steve from Minecraft, so that's how you know it's a pretty big deal for indie games. Even though Minecraft's not an indie game, and it, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. So it would only make sense to make a sequel to such a beloved game and a big piece of history, right? 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 First, let's talk about what exactly is Super Meat Boy. Well, Super Meat Boy is a game made by Edmund McMillan and Tommy Rafinas. It started off as a small prototype flash game made for Newgrounds, just titled Meat Boy, and focused around the same exact premise as Super Meat Boy, hard platforming to save your girlfriend Bandage Girl from the evil Dr. Fetus. This would spawn the basic idea of what Edmund and Tommy would want to do for an upcoming project, and to no surprise, it was a huge hit. Though, how exactly does the prototype hold up now? Well, eh. It certainly holds up as a prototype, that's for sure. It's definitely very janky compared to what would come, but it was still serviceable and did its job with making sure you understand what kind of game they want to make. Especially with early Flash. Yeesh. After the success of the prototype, Nintendo and Xbox both requested a game for their upcoming services, WiiWare and Xbox Live Arcade, which was a huge step for them. Thus, Team Meat was born, with Edmund as the artist and level designer and Tommy as the programmer for their upcoming project, Super Meat Boy. Despite living on separate sides of the US, they managed to actually make the game together and have their families playtest it. The game started development in 2009 and eventually released on October 20th, 2010 for the Xbox Live Arcade and later PC. Even though Nintendo requested the game from Edmund for their WiiWare software, it actually never came out. And this was due to the fact that the Wii could not handle this game. The file size was way too big. It actually went beyond their expectations with how much content they were adding. It was pretty cool. However, despite releasing on the Xbox Live Arcade at first, Xbox had no hope in this game at all. And by Xbox, I mean Microsoft. Though despite their low expectations with the lack of advertising, it was a massive hit, selling over 1 million copies by 2012, a huge milestone for an indie game, and it's no surprise that people loved it. The dark and lineless in-game art style paired with the smooth and tight controls benefits the game heavily in standing out as one of the best platformers ever made, at least in my opinion. Even though the controls are super simple, having a run and jump button and nothing else, the game does nothing but throw idea after idea at you, with new level mechanics being introduced in every single world, paired with its hard difficulty for YouTubers to scream their heads off at for that sweet, sweet revenue. I think if it was released today, you would hear game journalists call it the Dark Souls of platformers, because game journalists only think that Dark Souls is hard. No other game is hard, apparently. It's safe to say that overall, Super Meat Boy was a huge success, and that would mean people would want to see more of this fleshy friend. I mean, come on, it's Meat Boy. Wait, where'd he go? Yeah, so even though Meat Boy was really successful, Team Meat would go on to be silent for some time, up to four years in fact. With Edmund McMillan shifting his focus onto his new projects, The Binding of Isaac Rebirth and Mugenix, a game he tied in with Team Meat at the time. Actually, fun fact, if you watch the original Mugenix trailer, you can see he censored out the Team Meat logo. That's kind of funny. Both Edmund and Tommy were pretty dead set on the idea that Meat Boy should remain a one-off title, considering how the main game is pretty complete itself and how it doesn't really need more. Despite that though, people were practically begging to see something new from Team Meat, especially when it came to a potential Meat Boy sequel, and we were left with nothing but silence. Just as all hope was starting to lose steam, Team Meat came forward and said that Super Meat Boy 2 is a possibility with Super Meat Boy Forever finally being mentioned as a new adventure with Meat Boy. However, Forever was meant to be a game designed for mobile, with it being an auto-scroller using tap controls and having an online leaderboard system. With Edmund stating, 
Our goal with Super Meat Boy Forever is to design a new full-length platformer for touch devices from the ground up to avoid tacking bad controls on an existing design. We want something that embodies the original Meat Boy, but is designed around a simple yet intuitive control scheme allowing for pinpoint accuracy and surprisingly deep controls without the use of multiple buttons slash analog sticks. I think it's safe to say that we know how well this aged. Mm -mm. We were also given screenshots of what the game would look like, it appearing to have Edmund's kind of thick line style, however it seeming to retain the background style of the original Meat Boy. Okay, kind of a weird style, but I kind of get it. It's clearly just the prototype, and plus, it's a mobile game, not necessarily a sequel. It's definitely a spinoff. I'm sure they're cooking up something for a true Meat Boy sequel while they work on a fun little spinoff. That's great! And hey, it was set to release in 2015. That's so soon. So, uh, where's the game? Two years pass after the initial targeted release of Super Meat Boy Forever, and we've heard nothing of it. Only getting ports of the first game to the newest consoles with an interesting choice. For some reason, they changed all of the music from the original in 2015 with new tracks, and oh my god, they sound 10 times worse. I mean, just listen to the huge downgrade here in some of these themes. Apparently this was due to Denny Baranowski, the legendary composer that did the music for the original Meat Boy, did not want to pay for the game's music license with every port, so the music was done by Ridiculon, the composers of the Binding of Isaac Rebirth's music. We'll get back to them. Anyways, besides these ports, we got nothing regarding the sequel. That was until August 30th, 2017, when we would finally get our announcement trailer for Super Meat Boy Forever. Finally, the spinoff we've been waiting for. We can finally see what it... What it... But, but, wait, this is announced as a sequel? Wait, what? Yeah, so it turned out the game was changed from a fun little spinoff on mobile to experiment with one button touch controls to the Super Meat Boy sequel we've all been waiting for. And it looks off. The game clearly had a different style and none of that old Edmund charm that the first game had, both with the designs and the animation. What gives? Well, to everyone's surprise, in the same year, Edmund McMillan revealed that he had left Team Meat to shift his focus on the Binding of Isaac Rebirth and future DLCs for the game, leaving Tommy all alone on Team Meat to focus on Meat Boy content. This wasn't exactly promising as Tommy was only the coder, not exactly the level designer. That was Edmund's job. But the game seems to be coming out a year after the trailer release, 2018. So we'd have to wait until then. 2018 comes and the game is delayed. Again. A trailer did come out that year, though with mixed reception in the comments. But also, a release date of April 2019! Well, alright, cool. Just one more year should do it. Hopefully they fall through and we're able to see what this game is finally like. The game is delayed again until 2020 this time. So, what was going on? Why was the game getting delayed so much? Well, as it turns out, Edmund splitting from Team Meat had a heavy toll on the game's development, everything being scrapped from that point and built from the ground up, on top of having a lot of animated cutscenes. By 2019, everything felt complete, however, Tommy felt the game needed a dark world. Well, that's great news! The game is getting delayed for more content! And by 2020, we finally got a release date. December 23rd, 2020, as an exclusive for Epic Games and the Nintendo Switch. It was really a shame to hear the game would be releasing on those two platforms only at the initial release, especially on Epic Games. Ugh. However, after all this agonizing time, we can finally see how much this game has improved since its rocky trailer. Oh no.
Super Meat Boy Forever is genuinely really, really bad. So much so that I'd go as far as calling it one of my least favorite games of all time. There is just so much wrong with this game. It is bizarre. It feels like it wants to be like the original while also falling flat on its face while proceeding to drag it in the mud. The game was about five hours long, but those five hours were just agonizing. You could say I'm over exaggerating. Yeah, sure. I could be for the views, but I swear this game is just that bad. So what exactly is wrong with the game? Well, let's go over some of the main elements. God help us all. The story is about as simple as you can get with a Meat Boy game. Until it isn't. Just like the first one, Meat Boy and Bandage Girl are minding their own business with their new child, Nugget. When all of a sudden, <gasps> the evil Dr. Fetus is back to kidnap Nugget as part of his plan for revenge. Dr. Fetus, you cruel, cruel man. You can't kidnap a little baby child. So it's up to Meat Boy and Bandage Girl to save her. Oh yeah, and the game does this side story thing as the game goes on about this squirrel who hates Dr. Fetus for destroying the forest. Remember that one-off joke about the squirrel being sad about all of his dead friends in the original? You know, the ending of chapter one. Imagine that, but just stretched out for the entire game's story. Yep. It's a very nothing addition to the story and it would remain the same without it. What confuses me the most though is the game randomly becomes about time travel or something near the end? With Meat Boy and Banadryl becoming old and Dr. Fee's becoming a cosmic being? Okay? They try to play it off as this really cool sequence and like, oh my god, this is a huge galactic monster, but it is just nothing. Not to mention the fight for it is absolutely dreadful, but we'll get to that. The original kept it simple with it just being about how nobody loved Dr. Fetus, hence the reason why he stole Bandage Girl to begin with. He was jealous of Meat Boy and hated him because of that. It is literally said in the intro. They don't even need to explain the final boss either. It's just Dr. Fetus. He's just shooting rockets at Meat Boy, realizing that he won't die, and continues to try and kill him. But the narrator at the end needs a quirky and cool reason to say they punched a guy. It's, awesome. it's just so stupid. Don't get me wrong, I'd be fine with this if the plans were elaborated, but it is not explained the entire game. It just sort of happens after the squirrel falls on a button. It's just so stupid. Also, a lot of the story cutscenes contain wacky baby humor. Look at this baby being silly, isn't it great? She's so silly, oh my god, she's just a little baby. She has no idea what's going on. Look at her being so silly and nice. It's so cute. I have to buy merch of her now. So yeah, the story is just nothing. It's not even worth getting into anymore. So now let's get down to... I'm mostly going to be talking about music for this part, but I do have to say that the sound effects for when you punch an enemy are very underwhelming. Just thought I'd point that out considering it's the main goddamn gimmick. Anyways, the music is very bland and repetitive and is not memorable at all. The original Meat Boy prevented this by having tracks be a decent length and its entire score is unique enough to enjoy it and not get tired of it. But with this soundtrack, it just feels like you're on a merry-go-round that doesn't stop and plays the same looping soundtrack over and over. For example, the song for the final world has this one part of the song that plays about five times in the span of a minute. I was really tempted to just mute the game, but then I'd be missing out on the other tracks out of pure curiosity, so I just ended up not doing that and suffered for the entire game. Ridiculon is not bad at composing, far from it actually. They made some amazing tracks for the Binding of Isaac Repentance, but man, what the hell happened here? These just do not live up to the original soundtrack, though I'd be lying if I said this is the worst aspect of the game. So now let's move on to... When I first saw the game's initial trailer, I honestly did not mind the art style at all. It seemed like it wanted to replicate Edmund's style even with the weird inconsistent line work on many different enemies and obstacles. But they clearly had a vision for this style. So how does it hold up? Well, it's very bland and inconsistent. Don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about the animations and the cutscenes because those are very well animated, as they were done by all these people. Definitely talented artists. Hey, they even got Paul Tervord and Temi Chang, both very prominent animators and artists. 
but the style really doesn't fit Meat Boy, especially compared to the first one. The best way I can describe the art style is a more sterilized and corporate version of it. Like, look at all the backgrounds. As pretty as they are, they just do not fit the same game. They should have just had one style and stuck with it. All right, that's all the side stuff out of the way. So now we can finally get into the dreaded topic of... So, imagine you start up your first copy of Super Meat Boy, super excited to see what you've been missing out on, wanting to play a really fun and challenging platformer while also being fair. You start the first level, and it's the Meat Column fight from the Hell chapter. You slog through it, but you manage to do it, only to find out the entire game is the Meat Column fight. That's Super Meat Boy Forever's gameplay. This is probably the most shameful gameplay for a sequel to a platformer I've ever had the displeasure of playing, and I'm not even kidding. I absolutely hate this gameplay. It is so precise and unsatisfying with its mobility options that it left me frustrated for the wrong reasons. So let me go over the gameplay and then dive into the different aspects of content the game has to offer. As you know by now, Super Meat Boy Forever is an auto runner mixed with the elements of the first Meat Boy game. Kind of. You still have the ability to wall jump, but instead of the ability to move, you have two different attack options as you run to boost your movement, the punch and the kick. The punch is used to hit enemies or break obstacles and boosts you in the air slightly, leaving more potential for level design. The kick is basically the same thing, except when you're in the air and use it, you drop down super fast. I will admit, it's an interesting idea to give more moves to Meat Boy's disposal, makes him feel more like he has control in what he's doing. Except for the fact he can't stop running! Yeah, a huge flaw that plays into this is the auto runner aspect. I know I keep comparing this game to the first one, but how can I not when this is labeled as a sequel? In the original, the freedom of the movement gave you time to process the level design and react to stuff in a more free way. However, in this game, you're constantly moving, so there's no chance to breathe. It's all a matter of memorizing what punch or kick you're going to do, and it's just so much more boring compared to actually learning the level design. On top of that, you could just spend tons of time on a section just because it takes so long to get a grip of what the level design for a certain section of a level is. If this sounds weird, there's a reason for that. So basically in the entire game, there's six worlds. Chipper Grove, The Clinic, Tetanusville, The Lab, The Other Side, and OX Dead Beef. And instead of having 20 levels like the first game, this game has six levels per world. Pretty big downgrade, right? Well, there's apparently a big reason for this. This game has procedurally generated levels. What? Yeah, so each level is much longer due to the fact that they're segmented into different parts. This is best explained in the meat questions section on the Super Meat Boy website, which by the way has some of the worst answers I've ever seen. Super challenging but fair my ass. I solved some of these basic level designs through sheer guessing. Anyways, one of them states, Each level consists of a hundred carefully designed chunks that are placed together to create a level. Chunks are like little Meat Boy levels that are designed, decorated, and given a difficulty rating. Each time you beat a level, an increased difficulty criteria is used to generate the harder version of that level. Also, levels need to have a certain cadence to them so they don't feel like just random stuff thrown at you. We've worked on a system that allows us to give a criteria of difficulty and pacing that makes the levels randomly, but still within the confines of what we want the levels to be presented as. So, to put it short, they made it more complicated than it needs to be for the sake of having a higher number. Because of each level being designed around this complicated ass system, the game puts in checkpoints on each chunk you die on. In my opinion, this is a huge problem and really takes away from what made the first game so great. The original game had short and sweet levels. It was really challenging, but also fair. However, when you die on a level here, you respawn at the checkpoint of the chunk that you loaded in. But why would they even change such a simple formula? Well, there's an easy answer for this. The game had a tendency to brag about the fact it has thousands of levels, meaning that there was clearly more care about quantity over quality. Not even to mention that some of the levels suck to begin with. I spent way more time on certain chunks than I needed to, causing me to get stuck. And it's not like I could search for a walkthrough because everyone's playthrough is entirely different. By the time I had figured out what to do, I didn't even feel like I did the chunk correctly. I genuinely had the idea that I solved it by accident. Not a good thing. It just feels like with these procedurally generated levels, the charm of the original isn't there because they're just striving for a big number. The game gives you a seed before you start the game to indicate, yeah, it's all random. But I really hate that. That works in games that are designed around being random. Meat Boy the original was not a random game. Also, I want to point out that they have a speedrunner timer in the settings in a procedurally generated auto runner. Just pathetic, man. What else is there to look at, though? Well, there's the warp zones as well. Just like the first game, warp zones are portals that take you to a secret level in which you only have a limited amount of lives to do a special challenge to unlock. I honestly never figured it out. I found about two to three of the warp zones in the game, and I can tell you right now, they are nothing like the first and are not as good. 
These warp zones are centered around referencing the first game and also other games, mixing them together instead of being fun, challenging levels. Some of them could be fun, but that's only because they're all copying other games, like Punch-Out, which I enjoy really heavily. I didn't even unlock anything from doing these, and I spent a bit of time trying to get the perfect run on the test your meat challenge. The first one had three different warp zones usually, two normal and one where you could get a special character from another game. It was great and it offered new ways to approach the game, with each character offering a new playstyle. I'm a huge fan of how the game celebrated indies at the time. This time around though, after I searched it up online, you get skins that you unlock by doing very specific tasks, mostly revolving around collecting pacifiers. By the way, pacifiers are the replacement for bandages and I just ended up ignoring them the entire game because my attention is focused on the fact that I'm constantly running and can't stop to think about how to get them, so I ended up with zero of them. Yep, it really sucks because with the warp zones in the original, you did three challenging platforming levels to be rewarded with either bandages or a new character. It was a great incentive to actually do them. However, locking the skins behind both specific amount of pacifiers and the warp zones combined just ruins the point of their existence. On top of that, going from unique playstyles to just primarily skins due to the limiting gameplay is such a disappointment. Great, two gameplay additions done perfectly fine in the first left feeling empty in the sequel. Surely they couldn't mess up the bosses though, right? Oh good god, they messed up the bosses. The bosses are by far my least favorite part of the entire game. They were just so dreadful to play. The first boss is a little slugger clone, except you constantly wall jump and punch out the weak points. How exhilarating. Not hard at all. The second boss is this weird brain slug creature that's less memorable than Chad. Just another boring boss fight that gets really repetitive after a few minutes. Then there's a security wall boss fight, which is absolutely terrible. The fight is enclosed in this tight space and you're just wall jumping from left to right to right to left while you smack slugs into a weak point so you can beat up the head. It took me so long and the lasers of the fight reset rotation when you hit his weak points or him. Sometimes it's completely random and sometimes the slugs just don't even reach the weak points. It was awful and tedious, but believe me, the fights get worse. The next fight is a Dr. Fetus fight, which is just a barrage of clones, and yeah, it's not interesting. I had no idea what to do for the first 10 minutes, and I could just not figure it out. I had to use a guide a lot in this playthrough, by the way, even though that the levels didn't have a playthrough because everything's random. It was very tedious. You have to keep punching and jumping the waves of fetuses? Feti? While grabbing the jump up power up to punch the real Dr. Fetus down eventually. It's just so boring. And lastly, there's the final boss. It's a gigantic galactic Dr. Fetus, and the entire fight is just a super linear and precise auto running level. It is the worst boss fight in the game and it took me like an hour to do, especially when the mechanics it uses are super janky. It doesn't utilize the mechanics that the game builds up on, just two mechanics that show up in the final world. It doesn't even feel like a final boss, and which is super frustrating for the wrong reasons. These are all such terrible boss fights and do not work in the game's favor, especially when most of the time you'll spend on this game is the last three bosses. The first Meat Boy had you utilize what you knew from the world in its boss fights, while it also introduced fun mechanics and challenged your platforming skills. Except the Meat Golem. Granted, they're not perfect boss fights, but they get the job done in testing your skills, especially the final boss. The best way I can summarize the gameplay of Super Meat Boy Forever is a sequel that tries to be something that it just can't be. The auto running genre. It just... It really does not fit Super Meat Boy in the slightest. A game that is based on precise movement and level design, having a format that already worked in its favor in the past. It tries to have the same feeling of preciseness, but falls hard by incorporating the auto running element. It just does not mix well together. I hope they manage to return to the original format if they ever end up doing their third game, but based on their super dickish responses towards the two buttons criticism on the same meat question segment, it feels very unlikely. I think it's fair to say, based on everything I've said about this game, that it's soul-crushingly bad in my eyes. This is far from what I expect a Meat Boy game to be. As a matter of fact, it's a soulless husk wearing a Meat Boy skin to target a new audience and forget everything about what made the original so special. Though, I think I should specify, if you enjoy this game, then good on you. I'm glad you're able to enjoy something I just can't. It's just such a shame to see this game go through hell and back just to come out, starting as a mobile game for fun to becoming a sequel. It feels like it was almost doomed from the start. It sucks that it feels like we'll never see a true Meat Boy sequel again, I suppose. Although, that may not be true. In 2017, Edmund McMillan and Tyler Glale teamed up to make a game called The End is Nigh, a difficult platformer with almost the same exact controls as Super Meat Boy, though with different movement options to make it feel fresh. It does a much better job at capturing the first Meat Boy spirit, and Edmund has said that it's what he would have wanted the Meat Boy sequel to be like. I highly recommend you go check it out if you're craving more Meat Boy. It's a very fun game and even more difficult. And do yourself a favor and just skip out on Super Meat Boy forever, unless you like auto runners, I guess. So that's it. I'm Meatball and you just watched me get mad about a cube of meat. Let's hope this never happens again. Playing this game was actually agonizing.